Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. to Plain Talk and happy to be with you. We've kind of, you know, before the show started, Ben and I were just talking, you know, obviously with the legislature in session at Bismarck, that's what a show like this is going to cover a lot. But it it seems like we've gotten past the initial stage of talking about all the new bills that are being introduced. And now we're into the, frankly, what is sometimes kind of boring process section where, you know, committees have taken up these bills. Some of them have passed on the floor and are heading over to the Senate. We're closing in on crossover. Committees are still doing work. Um, and, and a lot of it's kind of hard to comment on cause it's so fluid. It, it's, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say about it, but we're kind of past the exciting part. Once crossover happens and the Senate gets the house's bills and vice versa, things will heat up again. But right now we're in kind of a lull, but we're still going to have an exciting show for you because joining us is, is someone who's coming on. Um, his department was talked about a lot by a previous guest last week. Uh, Robin Nelson from the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of the Red River Valley. I think I'm getting that right. Um, her organization does a lot of child care. I think she said they serve like 700 plus families. And she's saying that they've been having a lot of troubles with the process of onboarding new child care pr- workers. And part of that process is obviously the state of North Dakota has a, a background check, a licensing process that those people have to go through. Nelson says that that process is slow. Some of the the online aspects of it that were put in place aren't working that well. And here to talk about some of that is Christopher Jones. He is the executive director of the North Dakota Department of Human Services. It's his department that oversees that process. And of course, we're talking about this in the context of an overall, I, I think what most most reasonable observers would, would agree is a, a child care Crisis. I mean, that, that word gets thrown around so much. I, I, I hesitant to, to use it, but I think it is a real problem. I think it's holding I, back I our state the, economy. The terms appropriate, though. When sorry to interrupt, but I think the terms appropriate when it's stopping people from working, when it's stopping our workforce from being full. Yeah. At some point, that becomes an economic crisis. No, I just I, I wanted because again, it's a term that gets used so often that I think sometimes it loses its meaning. But to Ben's point, I think it's fair to apply it in this instance, because he's right. One of our most chronic economic problems is workforce shortages, contributing to workforce shortages. It's not the only contributor, but one of the contributors is the fact that a lot of people who could be working, who could be filling available jobs, who could be generating more tax revenue and more commerce and, of course, more prosperity for themselves, the most important thing, uh, are at home taking care of kids because they can't find anywhere to put their kids or at least can't find anywhere affordable. Anyway, We're going to talk about a very specific part of that, which is the hiring process, child care providers trying to onboard child care workers and and what difficulties they may or may not be facing. Mr. Jones, after all that introduction, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me on the show. So let's... Chris, can you kind of describe... Sorry, Rob, I just want to jump in. Can you kind of describe your role right now with the state government and how you interact with that application process so folks know? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. So I, I am the Commissioner of Health and Human Services for the state of North Dakota. Within within human services component has always been the central background check unit. And the central background check unit not only does background checks for child care workers, it does foster homes, it does adoption, it does a number of other different areas. Um, and unfortunately, per federal rules, you know, just think of foster, you could, you could have a child care worker who had a background check who's also a foster parent who then wants to adopt that child, they got to go through the background check three different times. That is our federal government at work. So we we have that on our radar screen to try to address. And I know that wasn't your question, Ben, but um, don't think that we think that the process that the feds have lined out for us is efficient in any way, shape or form. 
I wanted to. Uh, Robin Nelson last week said some things about this process, and I mean, she's she's expressed a lot of frustration. I mean, and she they had a press conference recently. Her her group and some other groups that also you know work in this this milieu um, are talking about. I mean, she used the words "we're drowning out here." She's talking about major backlogs for fingerprinting. She's saying that the online portal for uploading um, documents is 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 crashing all the time. Can you address some of that? I, I, I'm assuming you probably heard the interview. Can you address some of that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think to, to start with, I think the child care providers are drowning. I mean, it, it isn't just this. It is the whole system in general that you brought up in the beginning that it's a crisis. And I'll be honest, it was a crisis prior to COVID. We just we just never raised it up to the level it needs to be at. So I, I don't um, I don't disagree that they're drowning. I think back in to give some history back in 2018 the background check process for for the department we averaged 25 to 28 days to do a background check on a, what we call a full kit we if we get a full kit and what that means is if it is an in-state individual who fills out the application correctly we can turn that around in three to five days because that also has to be coordinated with the bureau of criminal investigation so bci now is our application process wonky yes that's why the governor put in his budget to automate the background check process prior to covid child there were more fingerprinting stations for child care workers right now fargo has the greatest backlog to get into fingerprint the only real fingerprint is within southeast human service center the wise have purchased their own fingerprinting system or or equipment. Um, there's also a bill to add fingerprinting system back fingerprinting systems across the state. So how do we create more access to the fingerprint? The other challenge, and this is where the federal part comes in, is that if you are have lived out of state in the last five years, we then have to ship that background check to that state and wait for them to respond. So background checks across the country are very, very difficult to get done in a timely manner. So it's, I mean, she is right, and we are doing everything we can to try to improve that process. So, I, I, Chris, I just, I want to, I want to just interject here. I, I actually, I don't know if a lot of people know this about my resume. I spent ten years as a private investigator before I got into this this racket that I'm in now, and part of that was doing background checks. Um, we used to do fingerprints. We used to do, um, and and at the time, you know, a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the records weren't online. So a lot of times it meant contacting people locally or traveling ourselves if it was in state to local entities and doing actual manual file checks. Background checks, I think sometimes people think like, oh, I put a name into a field on a website and I do a, I do a background check. Well, boy, if, if you're doing that, it's, it ain't comprehensive and, and you potentially are going to miss a lot of important things. So um, this is a this is a difficult process. This is not easy, particularly when you start going to other jurisdictions. Somebody who's from out of state, you don't know. Even within North Dakota, I can I'm not going to name the county because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I had to go up and do a criminal background checks and like the criminal. It was a very rural county, but the criminal records for like the previous year were in like an orange crate under a clerk's desk, weren't alphabetized or anything. I mean, there was it was, it was chaos. So. This is a difficult process. I want to make very clear to people. Go ahead, Ben. So, Chris, it sounds like there's a twofold part of the problem here, which is local access and just simple number of fingerprinting stations. And then what Rob was speaking to, to the federal uh, component. I wanted to ask you, how much authority do you have in your department to open new uh, fingerprint centers per demand? Because as you're saying, the back the backlog well you're saying the backlog tends to be in fargo now i had heard from robin and others that th that backlog had been happening and i'd heard uh, this is anecdotal admittedly from a detroit lakes area um uh, school administrator from a couple folks in bismarck i'm sure you hear from all over uh too do you have the authority to then create them to address those needs or are you stuck being tied to an every other year legislature to make that what how's that pro because if someone listening at home and frankly me says well okay there's more demand so put out more fingerprint centers we have demand for these workers yes yeah, so I, I the the short answer is i mean we have to go through the legislature i mean that's that's where we get appropriated dollars from that's where we get ftes from as you're probably aware they they do the ftes as well as as the budget now now to that end it would be to do onesie twosies, yeah, in a department, 
the size of health and human services, we, we can figure those things out. But then again, it's, it's always like, how do you best manage that going forward? So and it's not a it's it's not a simple answer like that. I, w- I wish it was. I mean, I wish I had um, way more authority than I do sometimes just to do the right thing. But unfortunately, we have to follow the laws that are. I shouldn't say unfortunately. Fortunately, <laughs> we have to follow the laws. That- no, in, in individual instances, it would be easier if there weren't certain checks and balances for budgeting, but they are there for overall mm-hmm. reasons. So, no, what you're saying makes perfect sense within the context of what you're saying. Now, you're saying that it has to. We're in the middle of a legislative session. Is that happening right now? Are those requests in? Do you see that being favorable? Because, and I want to stress this to listeners, if that doesn't come this session, then you're stuck with the level we're at for the next uh, two years. So where, where are we at with that right now? So far, we are on the Senate side as far as our budget goes, and it's been very positive, especially around the criminal background check unit, both to do an automated criminal background check unit, as well to add more fingerprinting, as well as to add more FTEs. Our our criminal background check unit has about four FTEs. So if you think about that, if one goes on vacation, they wait. I mean, four people is not, um, we run lean and mean. How difficult, it seems like every time we talk about one of these issues, and, and for instance, you know, we've talked about, you know, the, the rise in charitable gaming in our state. And so, you know, one of one of the one of the needs I, I believe that creates is, is the need for more oversight from the state. So, you know, we need more people to go out and inspect charitable gaming. Well, that means we got to hire more people. Well, now we run into the workforce shortage again. So it seems like every problem we have is like, well, our state's growing. We're doing more of this. We need more people to do this, except we can't hire more people. So how, how much of a challenge is that for your department? Are you running into the same thing as everywhere else where it's, okay, you know, we get the FTEs to do more background checks, to handle, you know, address the backlog, but we can't hire anybody. I mean, that seems to be the refrain across state government. Is it yours as well? Oh, oh, very much so. And I, I would also say, I think people look at the Department of Health and Human Services as being this huge agency. And, and, and we are from a budget and FTE. But the vast majority of the dollars that are appropriated go out to private providers. And oftentimes we think we can solve problems by creating new programs, but then we don't even have the workers for the new programs. And then, I mean, it's it's kind of like we're, we're just continuing to stretch and that lake is getting a centimeter deep instead of an inch deep. And we can't do anything well. And one of the challenges is workforce. So one of the, you had two aspects you addressed, which was the state one, which we were just talking about, then the federal one, which Rob spoke to as well, sending something to another jurisdiction where you literally can't control. And I understand you don't, you have no jurisdiction over what, you know, how, uh, and each state, my understanding of what you gentlemen are saying is each state does their criminal background checks differently, has different capacities. Is there a capacity for you as a department, speaking with the governor and others to lobby our federal representation to bring some more uniformity uh, to that process, understanding full context as a Herculean ask, but if if no one says anything, it's never gonna happen. Yes, yeah, so yes, there has been some lobbying as it relates to that. I can't say that it's been, you know, with everything else going on where, where it ranks on the priority list, but I, I know it's it's been discussed with the congressional delegation. Additionally, um, been working with the federal administration of children and families in Warden region eight which includes montana wyoming south dakota nebraska colorado and as as commissioners we've been really putting pressure on the administration of children and families that this process needs to be simplified i mean we need to make sure kids are safe but at the same time our our is every step in the process absolutely necessary in how we're doing this and and how do we work together to figure that out I'm interested in that, and, and maybe it's my conservative nature. I'm always interested in in red tape, and and if there's some we can get rid of. And I agree with you. We want to make sure that the kids are safe. But as again, as somebody who's done background checks, I can tell you, um, most of them come back clean, right? I mean, most 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 people are good people. That's that's the reality of of the world. Um, when you say that ways to simplify, what would that look like? Understanding that that not all of that is within the state's purview necessarily to change. But what, what would a simpler process look like to you that's still rigorous enough to ensure, you know, the, the sort of safety we want for our kids? Well, I mean, I think that's what we're, we're trying to figure out, because at the end of the day, each state does it their own way, too. And their legislature puts in their own laws as it relates to what is the bare minimum. So in some ways, I think the question is going to become how much of this is uniformity across all states and that becomes federal 
versus what does the state want to know in terms of a background check and then what level of privacy exists. So I, I wish I wish I had a simple answer for you, Rob. I really don't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because I mean, the reality is and I mean, listen, I know a lot of people who are just they're going to unlicensed daycares. Right. And I think I think that's I think that is a side effect of the problem we're facing. There is such a shortage. There are people who are just saying, I can't I can't go. I'm not condoning this, but they're just saying I can't go through that process. So I'm just going to provide child care services and it's going to be unlicensed. And, and please don't do that. The liabilities you're creating for yourself are are not small. But I mean, that's a reality. And and I mean, that that's if, if we can't get this to work efficiently, then the reality is a lot of people are going to be taking their their children to places that don't have any inspections or any child care work. I mean, that's that's what we're facing if we don't get this right. We're already oh, ab- absolutely. But I think if you think about this, too, I mean, this is a industry systematic issue. I mean, why is there a lot of turnover in child care? Now, granted, there's a lot of students who do child care work, but people turn over because it isn't a sustainable or a meaningful career going forward for many people. So there is turnover. I mean, there, you know, the people who do it for a long time um, are gifts from God. They, they work super hard, but it's not, it's not a way to continue to have an industry that can self-sustain itself based on the way it's put together. So it, as we create a sustainable industry, there will be less turnover, meaning less background checks. I mean, it's kind of like a cause and effect that we're dealing with. If they're turning over employees every six months, we're doing a lot of background checks. If we could, if we could make it a profession that people wanted to go into and stayed in and grew, we would have better outcomes for kids. They would have a a meaningful occupation that they could support their family with. And we would do fewer background checks. So So in some ways, I just, I kind of look at it as a whole system perspective. Just, just to jump before Ben asks this next question, how do we do that? I mean, how do we, I mean, it seems a lot of it's obviously tied up in, in pay for workers, but then you, you, you run into the chicken and the egg problem, right? Where, okay, we pay workers more. Well, now childcare costs more and cost is one of the big, you know, one of the big inhibitors to people getting childcare in the first place. So how, how do we, how do we turn this into, you know, childcare is a real career that they could go for and feel financially rewarding and not just something you're doing when you're a student or when you're young and you're at the bottom of the career ladder. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how we do that. How, how, how do you have an idea? How do we make it sustainable? Like you said? Well, I, I think it's the, the governor put together, um, you know, working with the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as child care providers, as well as businesses, as well as, you know, going across the nation and trying to understand what other states are doing, a, a comprehensive proposal for child care that addresses affordability, accessibility and quality. You know, is it going to solve every problem on day one? No, but I think we've got to start moving in that direction. And part of that proposal, while it includes background checks, it also includes trying to professionalize the industry and and building um, workers up and actually rewarding them and incentivizing them for continuing their work and then continuing to build that over time into a sustainable model. Um, because again, you know, it's not affordable for many families, you know, especially if you have two kids. Um, and even with that business model, you can't support um, the workers. So I think it's that the state has a role. I think businesses have a role. I mean, if they need the workforce, they, they need to be part of the solution. And there's part of the governor's proposal for those workers or, or employees that are above 85% of the state median income. Hey, employer, you put in 300 a month, the state will match you 300 a month and the rest is covered by the family. So I think there's a whole number of solutions um, that are out there that, that let's see how they grow to support families that will ultimately support child care. Chris, uh, when Robin was on with us, she had mentioned sometimes six to seven week waiting times and that those were happening on a regular basis. She said that she had seen, I, I believe if I'm quoting her correctly, Rob can correct me, uh, that she had seen that around the state. I think I had heard that too. And that when that had been brought up to either relevant parties in the legislature, folks voting on your budget, for instance, when talking about this, or speaking with people in the department that had been, the the turnaround times had been claimed to be shorter. And I, one, sure hope I'm not misquoting her on that, but it's not something that I'm assigning just to Robin either. I have heard that in multiple areas where I work, 
uh, within uh, folks that work in both childcare and schools. And I wanna give you a chance to address directly that turnaround time or claims that, there have been claims for a short turnaround time because I'm wondering where's, where's the difference? Where's the rub there? And I wanna be able to say it to your face and have you address it directly. No, and I think it's fair. And, and I'll start by saying, I mean, you know, it only takes missing one worker to having to shut down a classroom. So, I mean, I, I, I feel their pain. So, I mean, it just one can be, can create chaos within a childcare. But if we, and if we just take from it, once we get the fingerprint and it's a complete application that we receive, depending on, you know, on general, it's two to five days if we have a completed file. That, that is, those are our numbers and we do everything on a Kanban board. So we track where everything is at. Um, I'm sorry, now, can, we, can we back it up when you say Kanban? What does that mean? So example? Kanban is, is, a, is a process management tool we use. So we know exactly, so once we get that background check, we receive it, we do our checks, then it has to go to BCI. We know how long it sits at BCI. And if one is sitting there, we get an alert saying, why haven't we got this check back? And then, then we get it back and then we send it out. So we, there's multiple steps in the process and electronically we're tracking that. So, so like I said, for 30% that are done, well, it depends how you count it, but for the ones that we get that have the fingerprint and the application, all the fields are filled out, it's two to five days. Yeah. Now, 30% of applicants, here's, here's the challenge, and this is why we have the automated system in the budget, is right now, if you send in a background check and you forget to fill out a couple fields, we send it back and say, fill it out again. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is not an efficient process whatsoever. So that is sure. that is part of it. And then as well as sometimes we we just have to sit there and wait for the out of state. And that is that is the truth. So, but I know they look at it, how long does it take to even get a fingerprint? And sometimes to get a fingerprint appointment is weeks. So if I'm the end user, I'm Ben Hansen Child Care LLC, and I've submitted three background checks to you. Am I receiving those updates from, I believe you call it Kanban, your your automated system with statuses? See, and, and so you're no. saying no, he's not, he said no. Um, sorry, it's an audio format, so I got to narrate. Yeah, sorry, um, no. <laughs> but so is there a way for that end user to be experiencing that? Because it doesn't necessarily cure the problem, which is they need a worker and they need that person who's sitting and waiting on receiving a paycheck, very frankly, and making a living, but it does allow them to communicate both with them and with parents. We have someone there, they're stuck in this process. Even, I don't know, this might be a little Pollyanna-ish, but if it gets stuck in a, oh, well, it's stuck in a background check in Ohio, maybe they could contact somebody back there, probably not, but at least it gives them that communication. Is there a, so you're saying there isn't, in the new budget with this uh, legislative session, could there be something like that? I think that level of communication would at the very least nudge it forward in the right direction. I can't speak with 100% of surety, but I do believe that's part of the scope of the automated system so that there is updates to child cares on where that background check is in the process. Seems like it'd be simple because it'd just be a mirror to what you're already receiving. And email is not quite free, but close to free. Yeah, but then it's it's how do you automate it? I mean, that that's the thing. I mean, because we can't hire workers to be sending, you know, 100 emails a day. That seems like a Microsoft Power Flow solution to me. You just, uh, if, if your employees are getting it, you just send it to CC, send it to CC, uh, the applicant, uh, relevant applicant email. Let's, uh, let's get into Tech Talk, everybody. That's, uh, that's <laughs> it's no longer the Rob, uh, Rob Port Show. We're going to get into technicalities with Active Directories. Let me, let me ask you something about Robin brought up specifically. She said the portal, a lot of times when they're uploading, and maybe this is because you're talking about when we receive a complete application, you know, the, the timeline is, is this. She's saying a lot of times when they're uploading things, it's getting lost on this portal. Are there problems with this portal? Yeah, so that 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 is a separate portal. So that's the child care licensing portal. Okay. So that's the license for the for the entity itself. And that did go live a few months ago. Um, and we know it wasn't perfect. But again, that was always a paper process before where we've moved to an online process. And the what it's not crashing in terms of a technical term. What it was, was um, there were timeouts within the application itself, it's online. And if you are in there for more than 15 minutes, it would time out. So we have changed that timeout limit from 15 minutes to 40 minutes. And that seems to address that issue. The, the other, another, uh, another, I'm sorry, one more. Uh, another thing that Robin had brought up too, is she was saying that a lot of times the communication from your department 
wasn't great, where they're finding out about new, I'm, I'm trying to remember what she said, but new rules or something, and and essentially they're finding out and they have such a short timeline, it's like they can't comply with the timeline because they're not getting good communication. She said communication with your department is miserable sometimes, even to the point of like they would just like to get like a newsletter. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I am going to preface this with most of the child care providers don't have a business office manager and aren't checking emails because they're working during the day. Um, but to that end, I think what she's uh, referencing is the immunization requirement. And to be clear, I mean, we had a federal audit finding in April of 2021. We went through the admin rule process to address that. So there was public comment, there was meetings with um, the Early Childhood Advisory Council as part of ECEC, it was open for public comment and went through the administrative rules. We sent the information out as well as, you know, went out to licensors. Um, and frankly, I mean, Robin Nelson is a childcare, but it, she's an after school program. So really what it came down to is our licensors weren't having her submit immunization records because they're in schools, schools have the immunization records. Do we really need them? Because every other childcare was providing us with immunization records for the most part. So then when the rule becomes final on January 10th, then that rule only coincides with their licensing date. So in essence, the shortest amount of time where this would have been is 18 months. And it was communicated along the way. So now could we communicate better? If yes, if, if we, we definitely could communication is always a challenge but it has to go both ways too so i mean we i mean by i, I want to say by law we followed the process to a t but at the end of the day you know that isn't helping the child care providers because again they don't have the staff and resources to be following up on this which oh by the way that child care licensing portal now is going to ping them when there are new things coming on a regular basis and that's really why we wanted to go to that online licensing portal and not make it one and done events, but really an ongoing communication tool going forward. Well, I don't know if uh, Ben has any other questions, but I certainly appreciate you coming on. And I, I, I also appreciate what a struggle this has been where, you know, we're really trying to uh, address a, a very needful thing in our state. And it's, you know, again, our, our worker shortage. I, I don't know. I don't know if we got to start lying about the weather here or something to get more people to move here to take some of these jobs and make a lot of this easier. I don't know. Uh, we can we, start generating some different headlines in our legislative sessions too. Well, but that's not Chris's problem. That's not Chris's well, problem. That's a discussion. I, I did want to ask something that is in Chris's purview though, real quick, which is the state, the new website rollout. And this is more of a government wide thing, but you are ahead of a very major department for the state. Is there a protocol either in law or a simple guideline for te pre-testing, pre-public uh, publishing, what have you, pu public facing websites that people need as, uh, what's the right word, critical access, they need to use them in order to do their job. In this case, they needed to use it. My understanding was in order to do a criminal background check. Is there a pre-release testing requirement? There, as far as I'm aware, there's not a pre-release testing requirement um, but we still follow, you know, what I would say industry practices, maybe not best practices. I mean, because the best practices also cost resources to actually do it. I mean, I think one of the challenges this state has is we say we're going to implement a new system. We don't resource the development of it. We say that's other duties as assigned as you do your job. So we're yeah. saying and, and then it doesn't become a, a focus. And that's one of the things as, as we're trying to build competency and skill within even health and human services is how do we best organize our work and that um, becomes a classic pennywise pound foolish scenario exactly. too that directly impacts those that are then required in this case to use that website that is not a unique um aspect to your department but it is something that if the state on a whole with the it department or some kind of appropriation there could institute so that a uh, ghost site or a, a clone site that's not live could be tested by a decent pool of people, I think would, you know, pay off in dividends. And I, I hope uh, maybe other legislators are listening or something like that. Yeah. And, and if I could just add one more thing, I mean, I came from a 
healthcare background, healthcare executive, I never once thought childcare was important in any way, shape or form. It became very clear to me in early, early 2019 that this could solve, solve many things within the state, reduce the spend in health and human services, reduce behavioral health spend in schools, create a more productive workforce. So, you know, I, I wish people could sit, I, I, I could share everything that I've learned sitting in this seat to let you know, like, if we invest thoughtfully in childcare, our state can easily take over so many other states and we can reduce our spend in so many other areas and we will take care of part of the workforce challenge, not all of it. But I think, you know, the workforce is what's getting us through on, you know, why childcare is important, but there are so many other benefits on investing in early childhood experiences that are there. If we do this right, we'll pay dividends well into the future. Well, Chris, thanks for your time. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Hi there. My name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast, anywhere you get your podcasts, or at inform.com slash podcasts. All right, welcome back. Ben, I thought that was a good interview, um, and it was always good... I mean, I, I was I was wondering when when Chris Chris's office reached out and wanted to come on the podcast because obviously we had Robin Nelson on and she was she was being very you know pretty sharply critical of his office in in some ways that I thought were very you know very germane and I was surprised he came on he said she's right she's right yeah you know they're drowning now yeah. now he gave he gave some context that maybe maybe Robin wasn't in a position to provide or whatever but I don't I don't think either of them are wrong it's just th- this problem is is hard and there's a lot of growing pains along the way. And I think everybody's trying to do their best. And I, I think maybe one thing we learned is that, you know, Chris's, Chris's department could probably be more responsive and, and could probably communicate better. And it sounds like this portal round uh, rollout for the licensing of the, of the, um, the facilities themselves could have, could have, could have yeah. gone better. Um, but, you know, again, I don't, I don't think there's any villains here. I think it's just, it's hard. I don't, and I want to agree to that and add to it that, you know, when we're talking about this, this isn't, uh, you're not saying this, but just to be clear, this isn't a Robin Nelson problem either. I think she's very accurately representing a sentiment and an experience a lot of people are having. And frankly, I, you know, give a lot of credit to Robin Nelson too, because she's taking her position with Boys and Girls Club and her experience. She's currently on the Fargo School Board, it should be noted, uh, talking with those administrators, talking to those superintendents, talking to um, after school caregivers. Um, she is providing a uh, perspective that people who can't afford that or know where to go to articulate that, because they're just trying to work, get, earn a paycheck, take care of kids, juggle a lot of schedules. They don't necessarily have the capacity, maybe the political sophistication, but definitely not the time to go to, frankly, you know, a, a me, you, Rob, a Rob Port, a journalist, a uh, or to a committee meeting and express these. So I'm glad she's out there saying these things. And when you've got a rollout of a website, to your point, that you are required to use in order to hire and bring on those employees, you know, you're not going to have a sense of humor when the thing doesn't work because that's another two, three, four week delay where you need to be providing services and that worker you were trying to hire might get tempted away by a higher wage uh, somewhere else. To, to Chris's point, he kind of brought up the two categories, what he can do at the state, what he can do federally. I am going to get on my soapbox a little bit and say, I'm glad that you know, he thought I want I, I'd really like to get into those specifics of that he thought that this was in the budget for his department in the legislature right now. But it is yet another dart in the board for me as to why North Coast every other year session is a poor uh, form of governor governance in the modern era because if you have this need it is universally identified and thought to bring f- with uh, forth through a legislative motion if this were 2022 you'd just be out of luck you just couldn't do it well and that's a silly way of governing that's a silly way of reacting i think we're i think we're growing to the point i mean the idea that the idea that the legislature is because i think a lot of people view it that way we have a part-time legislature so that's a restraint on government except it's not it's really not if you look at the amount of like delegation of authority that the legislature has to do in uh-huh. order to, you know, they, they have to give away 
kind of a lot. You know, either they give it away to something like the budget section, which is kind of a mini legislature that, and they've gotten smacked around by the Supreme state Supreme court in the past on that. Um, or they delegate too much to, to the executive branch and don't maybe exercise enough oversight. Um, and, and the heads of departments that have to, you know, the, the, something is bending to the point where it's going to break worse if they don't take some initiative. That initiative might not technically be in their purview. Our, it's a nasty situation. Our state is growing. We clearly want it to grow more because we need more workers to come here and take some of these jobs. And and now we have term limits too, by the way, which is a, a variable in this. And I, I, I think you're right. I, I mean, I think it's it's time to really seriously talk about Either either annual sessions or or a full on full time legislature. You know and what I, I what I always hear as pushback to that is well we don't want to turn into California. No one's saying turn us into California. South Dakota meets every year for forty days. We meet every other year for eighty days. If you want to make the legislature more farmer friendly, do South Dakota system so they don't have to skip planting season. It's as simple as that. Or yeah, or uh, or you know recognize that. We're creating a situation where we need lawmakers around more often than not so that the legislature at times can be a check on government, right? I mean, that that's the way mm-hmm. this system of government is supposed to work is checks and balances. But if you have one of the branches of government so constrained that they can only meet, you know, 80 days and there's only so much, you know, their interim committees can do without votes of the entire legislature – then you're creating a situation where the other the other branches of government are going to grow in their authority, um, and sometimes in ways that aren't great. So, but- and sometimes, but but sometimes by necessity. And right now, to frame it all up, a lot of state government right now. We have a lot of government. We have a lot of statewide elected officials. I believe it's 14. I think we either hold the record or we're number two. We're way up there. We have more than California, more than New York getting elected statewide, more than Minnesota blows some people's minds. Way more. Minnesota has four elected statewide. We have 14. And this was essentially set up by the nonpartisan league at the beginning of the 1900s and on as a populist revolt against uh, Minneapolis bankers to make things, to simplify things maybe a little too much. But they were supposed to be proactive. Yeah. You love the word populist, so I'll use your favorite word. Just kidding. Rob, once again, like once, again, once again, populism reveals itself to be the stupid thing that it is. Well, so a populist check on industry, populist check on other government, it was supposed to keep a check and a balance going. But right now, very frankly, the dominant political wing in North Dakota, not you know, dominant is a quaint way of putting it, is the Republican Party and statewide office holders that don't view themselves as being activists in their role. I think it'd be a fair and even good faith way to characterize them. An example of that is Commissioner John Godfrey, the insurance commissioner wanting to turn down the imposed responsibility of like trying to keep down drug prices as an example, because he didn't think his department could handle that. Maybe a nonpartisan leaguer would think that, but then the legislature is supposed to be the ones that react to that. Now they're meeting every other year. It's there. There's no, the air in the balloon is so unbalanced in both ways. And I don't even think that's a left-wing argument. I think you can make a very conservative small government argument that it's very unbalanced having every other year session. I I think I, I mean, you, you, you veered off into, price controls for drug prices which i would argue is not a conservative idea government price controls no no, I, no i'm saying it's, it's not it's not, it's not the solution to that problem not. i i but i i think you're right i think it is conservative to say we need separate co-equal branches of government that can act as a check on one another and i don't know that we have that in north dakota and this is a topic that we could do like a three-hour podcast on so we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about uh, speaking of tension between the executive branch and the legislature. We have our state auditor who I, I wrote it when he first sent it out last week. I wrote about his op ed and I embedded the op ed. His op ed's now been published. I know we published it in the, the form communications papers. Um, I haven't seen it anywhere else, but Galleon had an op ed and he unloads in, in a way that, frankly, I thought was intemperate and, and irresponsible for somebody and in his position and petty. He uses the word corrupt and he applies it not just to the legislature, but also a lot of the government, you know, like like the local governments and, and the government agencies that he is in charge of auditing. And in that use of the word corrupt, I mean, that might be good politics. That might be good, you know, Donald Trump, you know, the, being populist, if, if I can use my favorite word again. Um, but but for, it, it's a word that means something. And, and I, I think somebody who's an auditor should be using a word like that with pre- precision. If there's corruption, 
that talk about it, right? Because corruption is a specific thing, and that's something beyond. Mm -hmm. That's something beyond. Oh, you didn't you didn't follow the accounting rules when you were classifying these expenses, or or you had some some audit finding. That's not corruption. That might be incompetence. That might be mistakes. Whatever you want to call it, corruption is. I'm taking bribes or something. Corruption is a crime. I can tell you as a journalist. I don't use a word like corruption lightly. If I'm going to use it, I had better have something to back it up or I've created a liability for myself. I've libeled somebody. But here we have our auditor who is supposed to be this dispassionate, objective reviewer, auditor, right? And he's uh-huh. he's using a term like that. And we, But we need to really get into why he's upset. But I just, I thought that letter was well, so bombastic his, his, and over the top. He uses, well, you are correct in pointing out i should have had the article popped here um and i don't but uh he uses a line in there in addition to the word corruption that i want to call out it was something about well the legislature's in session so of course they have it out for the state auditor's office again and he he sounds like the main character in married with children i mean uh, to, to your point it sounds extremely personal oh of course they're out for me well no i'm sorry that's a bit of that's a bit paranoid. All 141 members are out to get you. What What does that mean? What have you done to engender that? And he doesn't really give, he breaks down some numbers of how audits work in the state legislature that are well worth reading and well worth knowing. Well, but let's, I don't, let's, let's give the listeners, I mean, people may not understand why this is happening. So let's, let's yeah, talk about that. Yes, let's do it. Representative Emily O'Brien has a bill that would do two things. First of all, it would limit what the auditor's office can charge for audits. So currently the auditor, I don't, I don't know that there is a limit, but if the auditor is asked to audit like a, like a city government, for instance, and that can happen in, in, in a lot of different ways, like, like the local government can ask for it. Citizens in North Dakota can also, you know, gather petition signatures and, and based on that, begin an audit that happened in the city of partial. There's an effort to, to have that happen for the Bismarck public schools, um, and then he charges for that. And some of these charges lately have been pretty outrageous. You know, for instance, one of the people who testified in favor of O'Brien's bill in the legislature was the city man. I think is I think it was the city manager for the city of Partial, which has 250 people, right? I mean, the city of Partial is not a big place. Josh Gallion's office audit cost that city $26,000. And it happened in response to a petition. So this was not an expense that the city was prepared to pay for previous annual audits of their city cost in the, in the realm of like five to $8,000. So they're, they get, they have annual, 6, is what the budget to compensate the entire city commission for a year. Probably. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it was an outrageous expense for their city. And now all of a sudden they're stuck paying for it, which is still a hot potato. I don't, they haven't paid it yet. So, so that's one thing that, that O'Brien's bill does is it limits it and I think it's like one one thousandth of one percent of the operating budget of the entity being audited. Now maybe that limit is too draconian, but I think clearly we we got to do something because this auditor I think I think auditor Galleon is is getting carried away with what he's charging. The other thing it does is it also requires that our auditor be a CPA, which in his op ed Galleon took exception to. He said it was a personal shot at him. I don't know when I look around at like audit if you're a private Fine sector auditor. You have to be a CPA yep. to audit. And, and even if you want to audit government entities, I think there's even continuing education that you have to take in addition to having your CPA to gain mm-hmm. the expertise to audit. Josh Gallion doesn't have that. Now, if, if he's if he's got the qualifications, I why not just take your CPA test and get, get your CPA? I don't think so. I don't think either. I, I think I'm glad Representative O'Brien started the debate about the cost of audits. And I don't think that the requiring that the auditor be a CPA is is nearly the imposition that that Galleon is making it out to be. But that's why he's wow. mad. That's what he's viewing as an attack on his office. And unfortunately, there's that um, uh, this is a bit of extreme version, but it goes along the same principle as that Onion headline, the worst person you know just made a good point. He's not the worst person I know, and I don't know him, to be very clear. But unfortunately, the 1-1,000th one, 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 budget um, is a bit of a one size fit all, fits all solution. I can understand why he'd push back against that. It's unfortunate that he has a decent individual argument in his quiver when he's mostly shooting out these bad faith arguments that I feel are serving a larger ambition towards a continued political career agenda on his part. Requiring a CPA, that's nothing 
to be a state auditor. He brags about his numerous degrees, including a master's degree in finance and accounting or something Great. similar. Yeah, take before. the CPA so, test then. Okay, then go for it. You have to be a licensed, I believe, attorney in order to even run for attorney general. Why in the world would state auditor uh, be any different? Uh, we uh, Here's the opening line of the op-ed. It wouldn't be a new legislative session without another attack from our legislature on a North Dakota state auditor's office. Oh, and I, I, and I, I, and I, I read stating, that. But like, that's, that's not coming from somebody who is trying to have a good faith debate with the legislature about no. about a bill pertaining to the auditor's office. That is a grandstanding politician who is trying to create hysteria with the public. In, in in pursuit of his own of his own political career, and, and I got to tell you, Ben, I find that to be more. Than, I mean, listen, that's obnoxious in any polit- politician that you're talking about. I think it's all the more so when you're talking about the auditor. And mm-hmm. and I understand it's a partisan elected position. I'm glad that it's elected. I think the auditor sh- the auditor's mandate the auditor should be independent, and the auditor's mandate comes directly from the people. I like that. Um. But, but I, I, I also think that the sort of person we want to be auditor ought to be above what Galleon is doing with this. And, and there's a there's a def, there's an expectation that goes along with the statewide office you were elected to. If you're the secretary of state, you're elected on a partisan basis. Our current secretary of state and many, most of them have been Republicans. They're probably going to attend Republican conventions, be endorsed by Republicans as the current one is. And as and the Democrats endorse uh, uh, one, too. It's it's all part of the process. But hopefully there's a little bit of an expectation that maybe they wouldn't be cheering yay raw on the lines when it comes to things like administering the elections, because that's what they're offering office does if you're elected the egg commissioner you're probably actually going to show a little bit of bias and a little bit of passion towards any kind of egg producer in the state of north dakota in a way that maybe someone who's supposed to be more even killed with the state auditor has an expectation of very cool um dispassionate you know authority outside of personal bi- biases that he is violating time and again and i'm sorry i do have to quote one more thing from the article because it's worth displaying it is uh, it's worth repeating uh, clearly, this is a quote, clearly our legislature believes more in shooting the messenger than holding government accountable. Citizens should be concerned with what these legislators have to hide. And then he does not detail what the legislators have to hide. I would even offer, if he'd had a bad, he clearly thinks he's had a bad experience with the legislature. There is a professional way of going to the people and saying, this is the experience I'm having as a statewide elected official. This is what they are doing with my budget and why I I make a plea to you to contact your legislators so I can serve you better. This is nothing, this op-ed, I'm sorry, is nothing but a pity party and a continuation of bad faith audits that he's also reflected towards the governor's office. And I'll say it, I think it's because that he want, he sees himself in that office. And when he's shaving in the mirror in the morning, I don't think he sees an auditor. I think he sees a future governor. I I, I don't think you're wrong. And let's let's give some more context here. I mean, you, you're saying that the auditor needs to be cool headed, right? Well, we have a a pattern of this auditor coming out. And and listen, I was a Josh Gallion fan early on. I think our previous auditor, Bob Peterson, was I I don't know what you want to say. I, I don't want to describe, but I, I think I think he, he'd been on the job for a long time. Certainly as he, you know, he as he was leaving, you know, my my career covering state politics was kind of covering the end of his career. I kind of felt like he'd retired on the job. I think he was a little too passive. I liked the idea that we had a strong independent auditor to make our state government better. I have come to not trust the press releases put out by Galleon's office because I think a lot Mm -hmm. of times they're sensational. And we have some examples when we had Michelle Comer, who was the previous uh, head of the Commerce Department. He came out and tried to claim that, you know, there was something corrupt that went into the process for developing, you know, the state's logo, that that it, it, it bypassed the RFP process. Uh, oh, but but yeah. really, but really, it was like it was like an accounting thing. But he referred <laughs> it to the attorney general's office as a crime. And now all of a sudden, you have not just not just a cabinet level department head in Michelle Comer um, having to spend out of her own yeah. pocket for a criminal defense attorney, but you had just right, now people who aren't even political, just rank and file, just people, rank and file people who are members of the commerce department who have all of a sudden been accused of a crime by a statewide elected official and are being investigated. And and by the way, they followed the advice of the attorney general's office when they were doing all this stuff for for what what ended up being a minor accounting issue, 
where where they categorized something in I, I think it was something where the funding was categorized in one calendar year and it should have gone in the next calendar year or something like that. He he alleged that a crime took place. There was no crime. At best, at best, there was an accounting mistake. He did it also to the state library, right? He he claimed that the state librarian broke the law by miscategorizing certain expenses. Um, and that turned out to be a nothing burger, too. If you go and you read the testimony from the city of Partial on on rep. And I, by the way, I, I published it in my column. If, if you could find it there, if you go and read about it, they're talking about how the city of Partial is saying they didn't even know they were being audited. They got he, he said he was contacted by a friend out of state who saw a news article that his city was being he was contacted by members of the news media who had received a press release from galleon's office before he was ever contacted by galleon's office so is, what, what is galleon's goal here is it is it to to, to try to make to be the government. our government better or is his goal to ambush people and create sensational headlines around himself in pursuit to your point ben of a political career and when you sling mud for your own self-aggrandizement, as I feel he is here, you threaten other people with legal consequences. To your point, people have been hired to do a job with either misdemeanors, maybe felonies, whichever else. You create an atmosphere that makes good people who would want to serve maybe take a pay cut to serve their state and for public service as a give back. And you make it so they do not want to pursue any kind of life in public service. And instead, I saw a lot of this in the Trump era. It's not exclusive to that at all. Uh, instead, you get only the carnival barkers wanting to participate in the public process. And it's a self-perpetuating race to the bottom. And I. Yeah. I mean, just 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 to, I, I really want to illustrate this problem. So when when the off when when the get when the the auditor's office does an audit, they charge for the audit and that revenue goes into, I think it's called the state auditors. Op yes. Yes. The state auditors operating funds. I have the data from the office of management and budget here. Just to give an example of, of what has happened under Galleon, that funds balance has grown 488%. It was at like, um, it was at like 300, or excuse me, about $406,000 ending balance in the 2021, 2023 um, budget cycle, the projected balance for 2023, 2025 is 480, more than $2 million. And that is from charging. Those are your tax dollars. And I, I think it's fair for the citizens to ask, what are we getting for them? And, and we're blindsiding, you know, these, these local communities with, with these huge audit things. I, again, getting back to representative Brian's proposal is her restriction on what the auditor could charge for audits too much. I think it probably is. But does it start a debate about a real problem, which is the cost of these audits from an auditor who, who clearly has political ambitions, is a little out of control? I'm glad she started this debate. And for Galleon to, to characterize it as some sort of an attack on him by corrupt legislators is absurd. I think the problem, the number one problem we have in the auditor's office is we need a better sort of person in the auditor's office, frankly. Uh, and two things there. One, it's a disservice to the public because when you engender this lack of trust and uh, you know suspicion about using your office for political gain among both legislators and the public, that does a disservice because the auditor exists for a reason. Remember when I said there are only four uh, elected uh, positions statewide in the state of Minnesota? One of them they deemed necessary was state auditor in a state that has far fewer elected offices than we do. Most states do. And for good reason, they want some kind of a watchdog. Yes, one that's elected, but hopefully is accountable then to the people to be overseeing these government budgets. We need an otter. And when the otter cries wolf, it's the lesson of the boy who cried wolf. We, you aren't going to believe anything. And therefore, yeah. you might get maybe in uh, uh, unsophisticated, one size fits all solutions I like would... the one one thousandth budget. But then other real government corruption, if it exists or simple mistakes that need to be pointed out and pointed out. A stitch in time to save nine don't happen and it's a disservice to everybody it sucks i make a, i make a living i make a living writing about problems in government right there's some of my best articles i love it when they're uncovered because i get to write about them right i get to, i get to talk about the public with them it's great content for me and i am telling you that I don't trust this. This auditor is too sensational for me. I don't trust the press releases he put out anymore because I don't think they're the full story. 
And I think that's that's pretty remarkable yeah. coming from somebody like me who, again, I make a living from this stuff. If I didn't have any scruples, I could just glom on to everything he says and, mm -hmm. and not care that a lot of what he's saying is, is frankly, it's exaggerated. It's egregious. It needs to stop. Well, I, I want to say I had two points. That's one, it's a disservice to the public. Two, on the partisan level, he is an elected Republican. He's saying the legislature is corrupt. He's not making any partisan um, uh, uh, well, at this point, you're talking about the legislature, know. you're talking about Republicans. There aren't that many Democrats left. Correct. I want to know what the GOP is going to do about this, because there was this tension already existing last time he was up at a convention. He does not have term limits. Governor Burgum will in the future, but he's not limited to running for a third term. I want to know what the GOP is going to do about this, if anything. Does he go with a straight face to the GOP convention and say... I think most of you are corrupt. I write op-eds about it, and I try and audit you to either throw you out of office, shame you, or criminalize you. Would you please nominate me again so I can uh, collect wow. a six-figure public salary? Are they, are they going to nod their heads and say yes because it's the path of least resistance? Well, I'd like to know from folks like Mike LaFour and Sandra Haug, do you, what is your response to being called corrupt by your party state auditor? Is it fair to them? Absolutely not, but what he's saying to them isn't fair. So I want to know what the response is because... Uh, you know, does GOP just nod their nod their head and go along to get along? I don't. I don't think there's any question that Josh is going to face a he's going to face a primary challenger. I mean, I and I I'm not I'm not saying that because I've heard that somebody's going to run or whatever. I would be surprised at this point, given this Rubicon that he's just crossed. And, and this isn't. And, and the thing about that though is, I think he's going to he's going to then cast that as not a a rational response from a group of people that have just been frankly falsely accused of corruption um and, and and by the way i say that people are saying well what about like jason doctor and the whole attorney general office space issue i'm not saying that these lawmakers are perfect or that all of them have conducted themselves in a hundred percent ethical manner what i'm saying is that in fact, that's why you need a good faith auditor to point right, those things out galleon is painting everybody Everybody, everybody who disagrees with him is corrupt. That is a problem in general and in particular for an auditor. But I think what's going to happen is he's going to see pushback from lawmakers who I think are, are going to be tempted to exact revenge on him because, remember, they're in charge of his budget. They're in charge of this bill from, from Representative Bryan. And I, I think he's at this point, I think his plan is to characterize any opposition to him as coming from the establishment you know, or, or the corrupt, you know, majority or whatever. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a good, but I, I mean, there's obviously there's appetite for that out there, right? I mean, in the sort of, and, and if you look at where was the first place when he dropped that press release last week, where the first place he went is to that sort of Rick Becker, Bastiat wing of the party he went on Daryl Lee's radio show on KFYR and Bismarck. Oh, he went on, okay. he went on uh, Beck television with Gary Eminem. Uh -huh. Like he kind of ran to the cranks who eat that stuff up, and that that's the audience that he's playing to. Now, I think Rick Becker showed that's not enough to win a statewide election, but that's how he's yeah. going to cast it. Now, he, he gets to act intemperate. He gets to be a bully. He gets to make the you know paint with his broad brush and make these untrue claims, and anybody who pushes back, well, they're just – they're just part of the corruption, which which is the Trump playbook, right? I mean, they they would, they would view themselves as uh, this is a really specific reference, but you'll get it. Um, they view themselves as Barry Goldwater '64, failing miserably, but their principles are correct, and their second coming will come in some form of Ronald Reagan '1980. Some well, some version, some phoenix of Rick Becker will rise from the ashes and become the governor that truly creates small government. But the problem is it's not truly small government. It's just a bunch of crackpots, conspiracy theories, and self-aggrandizement. Well, they're, they're not even principled, right? I mean, I mean the thing about Reagan, Reagan was a great president because he was pragmatic. And, and by the way, had strong bipartisan appeal, won every state in the union except Minnesota uh, in, in the election. He had broad bipartisan appeal because he was a pragmatist, not an ideologue. And by the way, I don't even think that these guys are principled. As a principled, limited government conservative, I want my auditor to be credible so that when he goes after waste and abuse and fraud mm -hmm. in government, we can believe him. I don't want some political animal who's out there throwing bombs and nobody can believe because we don't know if, if what he's saying is true or if it's just a product of his, you know, overweening political ambitions. I have a dumb question for you. Is he up in 24 or is that 26? He's up. He's up next year. Yeah, I'll be not. very interested to see if there's a true follow through on either the GOP establishment or 
um, uh, just or from someone who really wants to challenge well, them, or like I said, if they just go along to get along. There are, I mean, let's let's face it. Uh, Democrats have troubles finding candidates for statewide office. Republicans sometimes have a problem with having too many. Um, there are plenty of skilled, ambitious Republicans in the state who would love uh, to have sometime, that job. Sometimes, and then I heard a lot of complaints about the way Al Jager ran his office, wasted money, dropped the ball on the website. We're going to run somebody different. We're going to nominate somebody different. And Al Jager kind of had that retirement wall in office, Bob Peterson sort of style of governance. And then uh, we were going to nominate somebody else. But I guess we'll let Al have Well, they did. One. They oh, did. They whatever. did. Unfortunately, they, they, they endorsed Will Gardner, who had to withdraw yeah. because of his peeping Tom uh problems Very, yeah uh, not a, not a great replacement i did want to um all right all right i think we gave i think we gave that what for i, I did want to um it's I, inside I for quick... inside for ben's positive positivity moment after uh, after all the uh the uh i i don't know what you want to say uh the uh, the angst we're gonna do something positive now Yes, uh, Ben's positivity corner. I like that. This got accidentally named as such, but I I wanted to highlight. I don't know if you necessarily agree, Rob. The there is a bipartisan support for a bill in the Senate to cap insulin prices at twenty five dollars per uh, per thirty days, so per per month, so twenty five per year. So I guess that's three hundred. Doesn't matter. Uh, for everyone who's on PERS right now, and that's the uh, Public Employees Retirement System. There's about sixty thousand people current and retired employees who are on the system in the state of North Dakota. Obviously, not all of them require insulin, but a significant chunk do. Insulin prices, you've heard about them. They're a a, a political uh, football that has gotten maybe beaten to death, but actually the prices have gotten even worse and more stagnant, stagnant in the last three to four years, sometimes getting in the four-digit range in the either month or quarterly expense. So this is going to have a major impact if it's passed intact as it was in um, uh, Senate Bill 2140 uh, in the House. It has passed the Senate now 38 to 6. So that was a pretty, bi- uh, no, just a bipartisan consensus. There's only four Democrats in the Senate. So that's a Republican consensus in the Senate, at least. We will see how that moves forward. There is, of course, a fiscal note uh, and a cost, I would say, for making people's uh, lives whole, simply, simply functional, able to stay in the economy and contributing to it. I think it's a very good plan, and it's directly addressing something that's a need and a bread and butter issue that isn't a hotline social yeah, uh, social issue. I'm, I see I'm, Rob come at it. Let's let's do it. Let's have it. Yeah, I. Uh, I, I think the problem is this is a state level solution in pursuit of what's a a national market problem. I I, I don't believe in price controls are the problem. I I think I understand why why people are are pushing for this. I mean, if you're dependent on insulin, you know the the price is outrageous. The price is also a product of policies that aren't set in North Dakota. And by trying to control prices, we're treating the symptom, not the disease. And I'm not sure that this is going to be the fix that people are hoping for. I, I think it's a Band-Aid at best. Would you have room in that viewpoint for a laboratory democracy argument, meaning to explain to listeners, if enough states are doing this, that the feds have to put their hands up and say, you know what, even the state of North Dakota is feeling need to jump in on this. Maybe this is a problem in interstate commerce we should take care of on a national level. Yeah, but then the, well, well, the price the controls, system, that's going to break. I mean, once once we've grabbed this authority to control the prices, will we give it back if the feds do act to address some of these problems, um, which, which frankly are, are tied up a lot in federal restrictions on where we could get insulin? Um, there's a lot that the federal government could do on the supply side of things to ease some of these prices, and they're just not doing it, which is a whole I, – I wrote a whole thing about it. I need to go back and review some of my notes on it, but yeah. it – it this isn't the solution. This is not – and people who think that we're going to pass this bill and everything's going to be great, it's not. It's not. Um, one of the problems we have is that we're having problems getting supply of insulin to sell. It's why it's so expensive. You control the price – you're only going to exacerbate that problem. I'm I'm worried about availability problems under this under legislation like this, which which I don't know. I mean, I mean to, to your point, maybe maybe it puts pressure on the federal government to act. Maybe how many people do we hurt along the way? I I think this is a be careful well, what you I, ask for situation. And I and I definitely want to see that. I think for you know I wonder how many of those sixty thousand employees in the state of North Dakota. But I mean sixty thousand that's a that's an eye popping number in a state that is seven seven hundred and forty thousand people 60,000 is a big big chunk and how many of those are paying for insulin that is going to be a major boost to their pocketbooks every consequence has to be considered to your point Rob if you don't have any kind of good faith argument but it's again something I included in my you know made up positivity corner segment because 
Uh, it's a bill that's directly addressing a meat and potatoes need or outcry. Whether you agree with it, even if you agree with the solution or not, no, it's I'm not glad, a hot on social issue. It's I'm, not glad, a, I'm, glad, not we're having, I'm glad we're having the debate. That's a worthwhile debate to have. Don't get me wrong. And, and the Senate acted. We didn't just punt. Unlike, you know, we, we didn't have an alternative. The uh, uh, price watchdog area with the pharmacy board that uh, Commissioner Godfrey advocated for. And unfortunately, as I thought would happen, if Bill was simply killed, and now it's the can's kicked to the next session. And I mean, that's my take on it. But I mean, I, I'm glad there's some kind of action being spurred here. So all consequences have to be looked at to your point, because that's very real. Well, that's it. We'll uh, we'll wrap up this episode of Plain Talk here. Uh, what are we working on in the future? I'm working on trying to get somebody on. Uh, oh, uh, sports betting. As we start to close in on uh, yeah. on the crossover, you know, sports betting uh, got through the House. It now moves over to the Senate. And that's a resolution, by the way. It, it doesn't legalize sports betting. It puts the question in front of voters to say whether or not they want. Um, I'm looking, working on getting Senator Scott Meyer on to talk a little bit about that. I think that's a healthier debate. Certainly better than what we've done in charitable gaming where we just kind of let them come in the the back door and now all of a sudden we're on the verge of having full on charitable gaming casinos in our state. There's so much to that discussion. I'm glad that we're having a very intentional debate about sports betting. And and frankly, I would if they put that resolution on the ballot, I would vote for it. I don't have a problem with people sports gaming or sports betting. I I'd be ex- I'd be extremely glad to have that on the ballot and get that validation. I also want to know and show to show my complete ignorance by the way and I'm pointing the finger at me. I think it'd be worthwhile to try and contact someone who represents uh, tribal gaming industry. If there is like someone who, you know, when we talk about uh, tribal lands and tribal businesses, it's not exactly, we talk, sometimes it can be tempting to mention them as if they're monolith, which is not accurate, but there probably is a representative somewhere within the gaming industry. And they've clearly had a lot of interaction with legislation and regulation regarding charitable oh, yeah. gaming. I'm wondering what the thought is. Oh, they don't, uh, they the don't lie. I mean, I can, I can tell playing. you, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but I mean, I could guess what it is. And it's that they don't like, they don't like the idea of the state of North Dakota loosening gaming laws for any gaming yeah. that takes place off the reservations. They've had a, they've had a de facto monopoly on gambling in North Dakota, mm-hmm. but for a few I'd be interested years. to hear what the opposition uh, sounds like. Cause I, yeah. I, you know, I agree with you. I, I would assume that would be the position, but that sure. is an assumption on my part. I, you know, anything from Scott Myers is an assumption too. So it'd be, be good to hear from him. For definitely. Well, I'm working on that, but that's it for this episode. Thanks as always for listening. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inforum.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inforum.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.